So good to be with you today. Welcome to Holy Cross. I'm Pastor Adam. You're here now this evening for the Monday Thursday service. Uh, Pastor Brian will be uh, leading the sermon today and I'm so glad to be able to welcome you. Um, Before we get uh, digging right into the service today, I just want to encourage you. I know that these are different times. So can I encourage you in two ways as we seek to be disciple makers that are making more disciple makers? Two things. One, Stay connected to the word. There is so many things that are getting pushed to you. Uh, your uh, social media feeds, the, uh, the news feeds, the, the conversations of all that's going on in our world. It's a lot. Uh, one, we got to keep control on how much is coming in and we got to be super intentional about making sure other things are coming in, namely the word of God and turning to him in prayer based upon it. So can I encourage you to connect with God's word and with him in prayer? And number two, can you connect with people? Uh, it is becoming an increasingly uh, lonely and scary place for many out there as I've had conversations along the way. Uh, So whether that's a a phone call and, uh, man, if you don't know where to start, uh, open up the church directory and uh, start with the people that are before you in the alphabet and then the ones that are after you. Maybe pick two or three in each direction and go with it or pick the friends or your small group or whatever it is, but call someone or reach out to someone via uh, social media if that's a better fit for you. Know that there is uh, a community, a page, uh, a group of people uh, connected to our Facebook page. It's called HC Community. It's a group that's intended just for our Holy Cross family so that we can connect in these times. Know that uh, there are people that are sharing what is vulnerable, what is real. They're being responded to in prayer with an encouragement. Know that you can do that as well, that it's a safe space for that, and uh, that you can find care and community in the midst of our distance. So I want to encourage you to connect in those two ways. Now uh, into things for tonight. Uh, You were told, and there was an email uh, previously, that uh, invited you to prepare for today matzah bread. Pastor Brian will be talking about that in the sermon. Uh, Also, So know that tomorrow is Good Friday. So again, we'll be back together at 7 p.m. If you want to invite others to be a part of that, there's a Facebook event for that as well. And uh, preparations are simple, a a candle or a light of some sort and a paper and pencil um, so that you can be uh, guided uh, through that night. And finally, all of this is leading up to Easter, which I know seems different doing it in your own home. But 8.30 on Easter morning, we will be together again. And I want you to consider as we step through these events of, of Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter, to see this again as an opportunity. Because the events of, of those, um, those times, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter, they didn't happen at church They didn't happen at the temple, largely. They happened in homes and in neighborhoods. So in some ways, we get to embody even more what the experience was for those who first experienced these events. So so see it as an opportunity and join me in prayer as we get going here this evening. Merciful Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather in our own ordinary homes around our own ordinary tables tonight as we consider the evening when Jesus gathered his disciples in an ordinary home as well, as we ponder the unique gift that Jesus gave that night from such a common space. Help us see more clearly the uncommon and amazing gift that you give us right where we are. God, be with us. Help us to hear to see clearly tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I heard a broken within Overwhelmed by the weight of sin is calling Have you come to the end of yourself Do you thirst for a drink from the well Jesus is calling Oh come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide 
Forgiveness was far with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus good to ponder on what the blood of Jesus Christ has done for us and that we're welcomed to come to his altar, to his table, because that's what an altar is, the table of God. He welcomes us there, but we come not as those who are worthy to come to that table, but rather those who aren't, but he welcomes us anyway. So it's fitting then as we step to this table that we're unworthy to step to, to sit at, that we would confess to him our unworthiness so he could again declare to us why he's welcomed us to be there. Join me. Heavenly Father, as we think on all you provide, all the ways you have prepared, you are prepared, and you are blessing us, 
Lord, through your word, even through trials and testing and temptation, you prepared to bless us through prayer and through the fellow believers and especially those in our own homes. Father, forgive us for our lack of eagerness to receive your gifts, for not seeking you where you've promised to be found. Lord, forgive us for how we have turned our backs on you. For our expectation that life will be easy. For not seeking your will and in following your ways. Forgive us for our selfishness. For wanting for ourselves more than we want to care for others. For our neglect of our neighbors. For our reluctance to give of ourselves. For our fear that we will not have enough. Forgive us for our reluctance to serve as Jesus did. And in the midst of our failures, in the midst of our faltering, Father, don't let our faith fail. Sustain us and defend us. Amen. The one who came not to be served, but to serve as a message for you. We, us, who confess our sins today, who ask for forgiveness in these ways, know that, that he has given you new life in him. Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, is your savior. And you are worthy to come before him because of what he has done, because your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. a story that we just sung our way through, really an overview of what these nights are all about, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and leading to Easter. It's coming. But let us focus our minds now on the Monday, Thursday events. Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 34. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, 
I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my Father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. The word of God. Well, grace and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Friends, there is, there is nothing like the look of confusion. I, I know you know what I mean. Now, of course, that look manifests itself in lots of different ways. Uh, there is the, the blank stare, where it appears like people are looking you, at you and concentrating with, with all of their mind, but their eyes betray a clear loss of thought. There is the eye dart, where eyes bounce back and forth between people trying to figure out what it is somebody is saying. There is, of course, what I call the mixed cocktail. Uh, that's when somebody affirms yes with their words but says no with their head, like, yeah, I, I totally get uh, what you're saying. There is the, the raised eyebrow, which I think is partially confusion and partially doubt. Now, in my household of origin, uh, we, were, we were famous for the phrase, say what? Like, that came out of my dad's mouth, it came out of my mom's mouth, it came out of my mouth, it came out of my sister's mouths. And I'm, I'm not sure if it happens to you, but this say what phrase in our household was the response to something we didn't understand. And in my household, when that happened, if I was explaining something to my dad and my dad said, say what? I would often just slow down and speak more loudly as if those things would help him make sense. And of course, of course, it didn't. And then I would watch my dad either do the mixed cocktail, the eye dart, or the raised eyebrow. Now, my guess is, my guess is that most of us, we actually want to move from the place of confusion 
to clarity. We, we actually prefer to know what's going on, to understand the plan moving forward, how it is we should respond, what all of the moving pieces are. We like to know those things because confusion, confusion puts us on our heels. It puts us into a defensive posture rather than a, an offensive posture. Confusion makes us feel inadequate and small and weak. And I can say beyond a shadow of a doubt that I have felt that way over the last month or so. And I'll be honest, I don't like to feel or look weak. Feel or look inadequate. Feel or look small. I don't want to give away to other people the truth that I don't know what's going on. I fear that people will see weakness, inadequacy, confusion, and if they see it, then they won't trust me. They won't follow me. They won't like me. The list could go on and on and on. So I desperately want to move from confusion to clarity. And friends, I, I don't think actually it's a mistake that we want clarity to come out of chaos and confusion. Not at all. Actually, I think it's an echo of our creative Heavenly Father. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 says this, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. Uh, another translation says it this way, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was chaotic in other words, God brought creative clarity to confusion and chaos. You see, our want for clarity is rooted in our Heavenly Father's creative genius to bring clarity out of confusion, to bring clarity out of chaos. Now, fast forward to the time of Jesus. I've often wondered how many people, when encountering Jesus, gave the high eyebrow? Or how many people who were listening to Jesus did the blank stare? How many people, when they're listening to Jesus, did the eye dart trying to figure out what it was he was saying? I have no doubt that there were people who were listening to Jesus who gave away the mixed cocktail. How many people, when they were listening to Jesus, their response was, say what? And not just the crowds, but the disciples too. I love this story in Matthew's gospel when, when Jesus is teaching about a sower who sows seed. And when he does, the scattered seed, it falls on all kinds of different soil. And then Jesus says this, whoever has ears, let him hear. And cue the mixed cocktail. Cue the eye dart. Cue, cue the say what. You see, it goes on in that text of Matthew. The disciples come to him and they ask, why do you speak to people in parables? And Jesus replies, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, they have been given to you, but not them. Right. Because that clears it right up. The disciples must have still been confused because Jesus then goes on to actually explain the parable to them. He says, listen then to what the parable means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in their heart. This is the seed that was sown along the path. Oh, yeah, that... Again, super clear, right? We've said this before, but it, but it bears repeating. There is, there is always a reaction to Jesus. There's no uh, middle ground, no fence riding when it comes to Jesus. Some people adore him, some are offended by him, and some, some are confused. And nothing could have been more confusing than the night that Jesus was celebrating the Passover with the disciples. So let's, let's think about the context of the week thus far. Just, just days before, Jesus rode into Jerusalem and he does so with shouts of acclamation from the crowd. The shouts of those who adored him. 
They laid branches and cloaks out for this coming king, like a red carpet at the night of the Oscars. And all of this, all of this is in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophet Zechariah, who says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. The prophet would basically go on to say that this king is going to break the chains of foreign oppressors and he will rule from sea to sea. Boom sauce. I get that one, right? Absolute clarity. Jesus is the coming king that Zechariah describes who's going to break the chains of foreign oppressors and who's going to rule the kingdom. I get it. Hosanna, baby. That is clear as can be. But the disciples gathered around that table in an upper room, had this clarity of Jesus' purpose fresh in mind. They, They adored him on the streets coming into Jerusalem. And so here they are, sitting in the upper room of a house. And isn't it interesting, sisters and brothers, Pastor Adam said this earlier tonight, That the first Holy Week wasn't really lived inside a church building. It was lived in rooms. It was lived in living rooms. It was lived in kitchens. It was lived in dining rooms. It was lived for neighborhoods. It looked a little bit like this and this and this too. In these places of home and family like this. And this, and this. See, church, we're so used to gathering in a church building that we forget much of the ministry of Jesus was done in people's homes, in kitchens, and on couches. You see, tonight as we gather around the table, the TV, the computer, as you gather in your home, you are gathered in your own upper room in a way that couldn't and wouldn't have happened had we been gathering here in the building of Holy Cross tonight. Now the Passover, friends, that Jesus and the disciples are celebrating, it was a festival to remember God's justice on evil and iniquity and his redemption from slavery. It was a, the remembrance of the slaughtering of a lamb and its blood painted on a doorframe as a sign of protection from death. But it is also a celebration of the release of God's people. In the Passover, friends, it was a, an age-old celebration of bread and of wine and other foods. And it was celebrated every year in the same way, with the same words, with the same food. Everybody knew what was going on. And so Jesus, this prophecy-fulfilling king, come to break the chains of foreign oppressors and to rule from sea to sea, was leading a ritualistic celebration of something the disciples knew very well. All is going according to plan. All makes sense. There is clarity until verse 19. Verse 19 of Luke 22 says this, And he took bread, the same kind of bread that you have made, this matzah bread, this bread made without yeast, this bread made in haste. He's going to pass it around and we're going to eat it. It is a bread that they make every single year. It is a bread that they know all about. This bread, this same bread that you've made, He took it, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Cue the eye dart. Cue the mixed cocktail. Cue the say what? The bread is what? It's body, I I, I can hear it already, right? The disciples having these sort of side conversations. James, James, what did he say? 
Because I think I missed it. I was, I was too busy trying to get the bitter herbs out of my teeth. The bread is, the bread is what? He said it's his, his body. Oh, yeah, that, that clears it right up. I mean, think about it for just a moment. Many of you have made this matzah, and I hope at some point you actually eat some of this matzah, the same kind of bread they were eating, bread without yeast, bread made in haste. And imagine for just a moment as you pass it around your table, Jesus says, oh, by the way, this bread that you made out of flour, salt, and water, this bread is also my body. Clarity to confusion. And to put an exclamation point on it, Jesus continues. Luke captures it this way. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Got to be honest, Jesus, that doesn't really clear it up. The wine, which has always been a part of this meal, is suddenly blood of the covenant, and it's Jesus' blood? Cue the eye dart, cue the mixed cocktail, cue the say what? We've moved from clarity to confusion. And certainly in the back of the disciples' minds, they've, they've got to be wondering about whether or not they're going to break the law. Hearkening back to the Torah, to the book of Leviticus, it says this, The life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given that blood to you to make atonement for yourselves. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Because the life, the life of every creature is in its blood. And this is why I have said, you must not eat or drink the blood of any creature. So the disciples, having heard that this wine is now blood, wondering, so if I drink this, then what? Clarity to confusion. If that isn't enough, this same Jesus who days ago rode into Jerusalem as the prophecy-fulfilling king now uses the earthly picture of kings, ones with power and authority who will be served by millions of people, and he turns it on its head. What you think you know, you don't. Jesus says this, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. He had, after all, began that night by washing the disciples' feet. Definitely not the, the posture nor the proper procedures of a king. Clarity to confusion. Now, I don't know about you, but I've had lots of moments over the last month where confusion has been the M.O., I felt weak. I've felt inadequate. I felt like there's so much information flying around that I don't know what's true and what's not true. I felt that like if Jesus is in charge, why doesn't he clear it up? Like right now, I feel confused and I'm asking myself, where is the clarity in all of this? Jesus, would you bring some clarity out of this confusion? Bring some order out of this chaos. But over the years, I've learned that Jesus doesn't always bring clarity. At least, at least not right away. In fact, I'm convinced that something Jesus, sometimes Jesus leaves me in that place of confusion because I have something to learn. And if he brought me out of that confusion to clarity too early, I wouldn't learn anything. So I'm curious, in this confusing time, have you asked Jesus, what am I supposed to learn Jesus, what are you trying to teach me, to teach us as a family? Have you asked Jesus to bring clarity in the midst of your confusion? Or have you simply thrown Jesus an eye dart, a mixed cocktail, a say what, and moved on? Well, take heart, sisters and brothers. You 
and me were a lot like the disciples that night gathered around a table, the same night in which Jesus would be betrayed, wondering how can Jesus bring clarity out of this confusion. And in fairness, Jesus wouldn't bring it to the disciples right away. They would eat, they would pass that bread and body around, they would pass that cup of wine and blood around, they would eat and partake and do their best in the moment to understand what God is doing. But clarity, clarity would come in the days that followed. Clarity would come as they watched the Lamb of God slaughtered for them and His blood shed for the whole world. A blood that would make atonement for all people. Clarity that would come on an Easter Sunday morning when a tomb would be empty. When there is not death but there is life. Clarity. Clarity will only come through the cross and the resurrection. And Friends, if we want clarity in our confusion, if we want to create some clarity out of the chaos that we're feeling, we need to allow the clear things of the Scripture to interpret the unclear things of the Scripture, to allow the cross and the resurrection to bring clarity to the places of confusion. Friends, I know, I know that these days are confusing. I know that they are chaotic. But I also know that God has worked life for you and for me. Nothing could be clearer than a Savior on a cross. Nothing could be clearer than an empty tomb on Easter Sunday. Nothing could be clearer than Jesus coming into another upper room to declare that he has risen from the dead. Nothing could be clearer than his ascension into heaven where he rules at the right hand of God. And nothing could be clearer, friends, than a Jesus who promises to return, to redeem all things, to restore all things, to make all things right. And so friends, in this confusing and chaotic times, may we root ourselves in the certainty and the clarity of Jesus, who for your sake and mine has become that Lamb of God who pours out his blood, who is wiped on the doorposts of our hearts, who is our protection. May that truth May our hearts be rooted in that truth today and every day. And so friends, may the certainty of Jesus, may, it, may he guard your heart and your mind. And may it be filled with peace and joy now and always. Amen. How fantastic it is to uh, hear the message of clarity in the midst of so many things that are confusing. Another bit of hope in this, and I hope a bit of clarity for you, is that it's not as confusing to our Heavenly Father, who knows all, is over all, knows how this is all going to turn out in the end, and that as we lean on and as we root ourselves in Jesus, that we can entrust these things to Him for whom it is clear, and we can find clarity not in knowing all the things, but in trusting ourselves and our cares to the one whose hands they are in. So let's do that here this evening. Father of all wisdom, we lift to you our minds which, with swir which swirl with confusion. Sometimes about you and, and what you're all about. Sometimes about the world we live in. How to approach each day. How to, to face the challenges, the ones that are known. And sometimes even harder, the ones that we are anticipating but don't yet fully know. Lord, give clarity to us on the things that we can know. Lord, lead us to rhythms that, that connect us to you and to one another, that are good for our bodies and for our minds and for our souls. Lord, give us clarity on how to stay safe well. Lord, give us clarity as we uh, 
lift up the researchers and give them clarity as they think about uh, how to go at caring for our communities well, uh, what uh, decisions need to be made, uh, what uh, things need to be formulated so that there can be relief. Father, we pray that you give clear thinking and confidence in your leading to us and to all those, especially those who lose sleep at night, who are in responsible spots for making decisions that affect the welfare of so many. Lord, you've promised that your word will be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Help us to see where you lead. Servant of all, Jesus Christ, thank you for your example of selfless service, of, of washing feet, of delivering the word of the Father to your people in ways that even though they were confusing at first, that you bring clarity to in the cross and in the empty tomb. Lord, thank you for showing us what it looks like to use power, not for the sake of forcing or leveraging, but freely to serve and expecting nothing in return. And alive in us, and all who are responsible for serving the welfare of others to do the same. Father, especially I lift to you today parents that are now taking on more fully being teachers and coaches and counselors, in addition to the normal, usual parenting responsibilities and of caring for the home. Lord, we pray that you be with medical workers that are now not only in the position of caring for physical needs, but also being the pastor and the family support that isn't available to their parents. Lord, give them a heart like yours. Send them your spirit to empower them for this task. Give endurance. Help them to take one day at a time. Lord, we know that each one has enough worries of its own. Help us to do them one at a time and to seek to join you in what you're already doing so that we, so that they don't feel alone in the responsibilities before us. Father, we thank you for the gift that you gave through Jesus Christ in this supper that he instituted on that night before he went to the cross. Lord, lead us to hunger and to eagerly await like Jesus did till when we get to receive this together again. Help us to see more clearly in the waiting how great a gift that you give. Jesus, thank you for your concern, not just for our spiritual well-being, but for our physical and emotional well-being as well. Lord, we lift to you those concerns of our hearts and the people who we know that are faltering, that are ill, that are hospitalized, that are grieving. Bring healing and hope. We name them before you now. We lift to you those loved ones about whom we care and those situations over which we have no control and those burdens we carry on our hearts. Help us not to face any of these as if we are alone in them. We entrust them to you, our Heavenly Father, using the pattern that Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
It's been so good to be with you in your home, gathered around your table or at your couch this evening. Look forward to uh, seeing you uh, tomorrow night, same time, as we uh, look at the events uh, of Good Friday. And, and as we prepare for that, may, may God be with you as you go from here. May you trust that there can be clarity in the midst of this confusion as we look to our Savior, Jesus the Messiah. God be with you as you go from here. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.